Fred uh, Kirschman with the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, Fred is a long time national and even international leader in sustainable agriculture. Uh, he shares an appointment as a distinguished fellow um, <clears throat> with the Leopold Center and as president of what's called Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture in New York State. Uh, he also continues to manage his family's 2,600-acre uh, certified organic farm, sorry, in South Central North Dakota. So please put your hands together and help me welcome Fred to the <laughs> job this morning uh, is to uh, share with you some uh, concerns and possibilities and opportunities uh, for the future uh, of agriculture. And I want to uh, um, say right off, uh, uh, right off the bat here that uh, we as a human species do not have a very good record of predicting the future. Uh, so I'm not going to stand here and try to predict the future for you but rather to uh, try to anticipate some of the changes that are coming at us. And anticipating changes are a little different from predicting the future. Um, and hopefully, out of that, we're going to see not only some things that uh, are pretty foreboding as we anticipate our future, as you will find out in the next few minutes, uh, but also that there are some incredible opportunities uh, that can really uh, help to uh, uh, really help to uh, reshape our culture, which I think is part of the things that we need to do. Uh, because if you think about it, uh, we often convince ourselves that the life that we have now is the best that we've ever had. Uh, and in point of fact, that's not true. Uh, and it could be better. And our food system can in fact play a key role in that. Uh, so uh, if in the first part of my talk you start to think, like, oh my God, it's all going to hell and it's gloom and gloom, because uh, there's going to be some of that. Uh, there's also uh, going to be a second part of it that's going to be a little more encouraging. Now, as we think about the future, uh, and if you, if you pay attention at all to the public media, uh, the, way of, the way that the food system is usually framed as we think about the future is, how are we going to feed 9 billion people by the year 2050? How often have you seen that statement in the press? And of course, if you think about it, uh, that statement is designed to tell us that uh, all we have to do in the future is to do more of what we've done in the past. Uh, because if you say, how are we going to feed 9 billion people? Well, we know how we've uh, been increasing our food production dramatically over the last century. Uh, you know, double, tripled, in some instances quadrupled our uh, grain production uh, per acre. Uh, and we've, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've simply been successful in continuing to produce more. And so the implication is, how are we going to feed 9 billion people now is we simply got to do more than what we've done in the past, and then the problem is solved, right? And so none of us have to worry about that because all of the creators of the new technologies, et cetera, are going to keep doing this, and they'll solve it so we can, you know, just not worry about it. Well. Uh, you know, from my perspective, that is one of the uh, worst things that we could follow. In the first place, uh, we know now from studies that have been done that we actually now are producing enough food today to feed 10 billion people. And yet almost a billion are going hungry. So that's got to tell us that it, the problem of hunger is not a problem of production. Uh, it's a problem of poverty. It's a problem of access. Uh, it's a problem of being uh, able to have an entitlement uh, to the food that's being produced. It's also a problem of waste, because we're currently wasting almost 40% of the food that we produce in our current system. Now, that doesn't mean that if we continue to have a growing population indefinitely in the future, which probably isn't going to be possible anyway, but if we were to follow that path, we may still have a production problem at some point, but it's not the problem today. The problem today is a very different one. So let's think a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, changes that are coming at us as a way of trying to deal with this. And I think for that, one of the things that's been most useful to me is to think about this in, the, in a historical context. And one of the individuals that has done, I think, one of the best jobs of giving us a frame, and here's where, you know, I, I normally don't do PowerPoint because they kind of get in the way from me, but um, 
if here's one place where a PowerPoint slide would be useful, and I actually have one, but setting the whole system up just to do that didn't seem to make sense to me. But you all have good imagination, so you imagine a, um, a screen up here, and then imagine a timeline across that screen. And that timeline uh, is a timeline which uh, helps us understand how we as humans have fed ourselves ever since we've been on the planet. And an individual that's done that for me is a man by the name of Ernest Shusky, who's an anthropologist. And he wrote a book a number of years ago called Culture and Agriculture. And the subtitle of the book is An Ecological Introduction to Traditional and Modern Farming Systems. And it was published back in 1989. And as an anthropologist, as you would expect, Ernest Shusky tries to help us understand how we fed ourselves ever, ever since we've been on the planet. And, uh, you know, we can't have an exact date when we, as uh, what we now call humans, you know, the two-legged uh, homo sapiens that, uh, you know, can do all kinds of things. We basically emerged on the planet, we evolved on the planet about 200,000 years ago. So now, if you think this timeline across, imagine this timeline across the screen here, so you're going to go about two-thirds of the way across that timeline, uh, about 190,000 years. We fed ourselves as hunter-gatherers. We weren't food producers, we were food collectors. So we simply went out into nature like other species, and we you know, collected what we could find to feed ourselves, and that's the way we fed ourselves for that long period of time. And uh, Ernest Shusky points out that that was the most efficient food system we ever had. He calculates that we were getting about 20 kilocalories of food energy for every one kilocalorie of energy that we invested in feeding ourselves. And then about 10,000 years ago, we entered a different way of feeding ourselves, which we now call the Neolithic period. And that's when we started to do agriculture, when we started to be food producers. And during most of that period of time, that, so, so now you've got, a, a, you know, on the timeline, a period of about another two inches long, right? So after this long two thirds and another two inches is this Neolithic period. And we fed ourselves during most of that period of time through what we now call a, uh, a, um, a, 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 you know, a slash and burn kind of agriculture. We would take an area out of nature uh, that had perennials, either grasses or trees, and we'd take those out and burn them, and the ashes would go into the soil, and then we would cultivate the soil and then grow whatever food we wanted to grow. And that would work pretty well for a couple of years, and then the, the nutrients in the soil would become depleted, and then we'd slash and burn another place. And we'd leave this one lay idle for maybe 10 or 12 years until the soil restored itself, and then we'd go back and harvest that again. And Ernest Shusky calls that a very land-intensive kind of way of feeding ourselves. It also was much less efficient. Now we were only getting about 10 kilocalories of food energy for every one kilocalorie of energy we invested. But nevertheless, that's how we fed ourselves. And then Shusky points out that uh, about the 1930s, uh, the early, in other words, the early 20th century, we entered into a third era of feeding ourselves, the one that we're in now. And he called this the neocaloric era because it's entirely based on old calories. So we discovered back in the 1840s uh, that we could, we didn't have to do all of this slash and burn or the uh, uh, laborious uh, practice of manuring our soils, etc. that all we needed to do was take these minerals, primarily nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and uh, put that into the soil, and then we could produce all of the food that we wanted to produce. And so that's the path that we started on it. But it wasn't really until, well, it really actually wasn't until after the Second World War that that way of feeding ourselves became a, an aggressive, predominant way of doing it. And part of the reason for that was because, uh, you know, in 1909, uh, Haber and Bosch discovered a way of making nitrogen out of the, out of the atmosphere primarily for uh, explosives in, in the war, during the war, and then after the war was over, what were we gonna do uh, with, this, with these explosives? And we discovered, well, we could actually use them for fertilizer, right? And then the whole era of cheap fertilizer became available. And I can tell you on our own farm, my, my father and mother started farming on a farm in North Dakota in 1930, and, um, and, and it was primarily a slash and burn kind of farming. You know, you would take a piece of prairie, plow it up, 
uh, you uh, grow some wheat in it and maybe some oats until the nutrients are depleted and you plow up another piece of prairie. And then when these fertilizers became available at the end of the Second World War, suddenly uh, here was a new resource that we could use and then we began to use the fertilizers and of course you could see in the field, you know, back then the fertilizers yeah, and we, what, basically what we did was uh, you would attach a fertilizer attachment to your cedar and it was driven by a V-belt off of the, you know, off of the uh, ground wheels. And, uh, and then of course, you know, as you go across, bumping across the field, sometimes the belt would slip. And from the day that the wheat came up out of the ground until you harvested, you could see exactly where the belt slipped. And my father said, well, that's clear. We could never farm without fertilizer again. So that, so we started on this new path of this neocaloric period. Now, Ernest Shusky says that this neocaloric period will of necessity be a very short period of time in the timeline of human history. So again, as you imagine this timeline, you got this long two thirds of it, then, then about two inches for the Neolithic period, and then the neocaloric period is gonna be about a half inch. It cannot last much more than 100 to 150 years because it's old calories, and when they're gone, they won't be there anymore. So what are those old calories? Well, first of course, of course, they're fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are stored energy. That it, it, fossil fuels are really sunlight. And over a period of millions of years, that sunlight was transformed through a series of biological practices or uh, bi bi biological functions uh, in, in, in our world. Uh, they turned into oil and coal and natural gas. And then all we needed to do was to extract that those fossil fuels and process them, and then we had them, and that was our source of energy. Now, even though we had this cheap energy, this neocaloric era is still one of the least efficient food systems we ever had. We are now using 10 kilocalories of energy for every one kilocalorie of food we put on our tables. And the reason that it's important for us to recognize that as we think about the future is that uh, this is a, and our, our, food, our food system today is the most energy intensive food system we've ever had. We talk about our food system as being the most efficient food system we've ever had, and that's true from the point of labor efficiency. It's not true in terms of energy efficiency. So once, the, once that, those old calories of fossil fuels are no longer there, what are we gonna do? The big question mark then, as you look at this timeline then, is beyond the neocaloric era, what kind of food system are we gonna have? And uh, you know, um, it's, not, it's not gonna be only when we run out of oil and coal, it's gonna be when it becomes too costly, when it becomes too expensive, when it starts to take more energy to extract those remaining fossil fuels from the, gra from the ground uh, than the energy that we get out of it. And how far are we from that? Again, I'm not gonna predict the future here, but most of the colleagues that I talk that are really serious about this and not simply promoting the future of oil, they're saying, you know, give it another 10 or 20 years and it probably won't be available anymore. And T. Boone Pickens, who is an oil guy, so we should you know, pay some attention to him, and he, he mentioned two years ago that we should expect that in 10 years, crude oil will be $350 a barrel. Now, I think he made that statement before he began to recognize the amount of additional oil we were gonna get out of fracking, et cetera, et cetera. And even if you ignore all of the potential damage to the environment from that, uh, the, uh, the amount of, the continuing amount of oil and the cost, I mean, even in North Dakota now where we're doing a lot of fracking, uh, the, even the oil companies are saying, if oil ever goes below $100 a barrel, we can't do this anymore because that's, what that's, cause that's the cost factor. So, Let's assume that, so if, if, if it isn't 10 years from what T. Boone Pickens said, that's eight years from now. Well, maybe not in eight years, but to think about it in terms of 10 or 20 years from now of crude oil getting to $350 a barrel, uh, that's not, uh, that's not a, a projection uh, that's uh, uh, you know, un unrealistic. Maybe it'll be 30 years from now. However long it is, it's gonna be a relatively, a very short period of time in this timeline of human history. So if we're gonna anticipate the changes that are coming at us, that's one of the things we have to start taking seriously. So what I, lo what I like to do now when, uh, you know, and I, I spent a lot of my time talking with farmers you know, around the country, is to put that on the table, say, okay, you know, let's assume 
that in the not too distant future, certainly in the lifetime of our young farmers now, uh, this, this reality of uh, a, uh, a future without cheap energy uh, is going to be one that we have to put into the equation. How are we going to produce our food when we don't have this cheap energy? A second of these old calories are the minerals. And we're also depleting our minerals. And there are two really good re resources on this, again, if you want to look at. One is uh, a new book which just came out a short time ago by Ugo Bardi. Uh, he uh, published a new uh, Club of Rome report, which is called Extracted. And it's a, a very detailed analysis of all of the minerals that we have now extracted or are in the process of extracting that are not going to be there for the future. And many of these minerals are essential to our current food production. Again, part of the old calories that we're using. Certainly rock phosphate and potassium are, uh, are critical to these. And uh, already today, we only have four countries that still have rock phosphate reserves and only four that still have potash reserves for potassium. Uh, you know, energy is a little different because we can get energy out of the air, but again, you've got to have the, you gotta have the cheap energy uh, in order to, I mean, the nitrogen, right? You've got to have the cheap energy to get the nitrogen. So the depletion, and then it's not just uh, the depletion of the minerals that we use directly for producing food, but it's also iron ore and copper, all the things that we use for, the, uh, for our mechanization and our machinery, et cetera. Uh, those, those won't be there either. And the second resource that uh, is uh, kind of disturbing about all of this is Michael Clare, who uh, wrote a book called uh, The Race for What's Left. And he goes into a very detailed analysis of all of the minerals that we are depleting and how this could lead us to a series of resource, resource wars in where each, each of us are going to try to grab onto the last ones as long as we can. And if you kind of look at some of the you know, disturbances that are going on around the country right now, around the world right now, and these political uh, uh, tensions that are going on, uh, and you already see some of the trading that's being talked about in terms of, you know, are you going to get this energy or that energy? You know, which country's going to benefit from that? Uh, how are we going to uh, uh, put some uh, tension, uh, some pressures on countries to get them to do what we want them to do because we're going to allow them and not allow them to get access uh, to these minerals? So we could, in fact, move into a future where we're going to use the remaining resources that we have to fight for the resources. And that's basically what Michael Clare warns us about. And he makes a very compelling case for this. Now, the reason he writes this book is to say, look, folks, wake up. You know, this is not the kind of future that we should go. We've got to figure out a different way to do this. But again, when we think about our future food system and how we're going to feed, you know, whatever our human population is, these are all issues that we have to think about. And then there's at least a third, there's some other resources we can talk about. There's a third resource that's important, and that's water. Now, you could argue that water is not an old calorie because it is a renewable resource, and to some extent that's true. But the rate at which we're using fresh water now already is not sustainable. We're drawing down a fresh water resources all across the planet. In China and in India, we're drawing down the, 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 ground, or the sources of groundwater, the aquifers, uh, by up to 1,000 and 2,000 feet already. But even close to home, uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, which all of you know, uh, provides the irrigation water for the whole heartland all the way from southern South Dakota to Texas. And we've known for a long time that we've already drawn down the Ogallala Aquifer by half since 1960. But two recent studies have been done now just in the last few years, the one at uh, Kansas State University just in the last few months. And both have said the same thing, and that is if we continue to use to extract water out of the Ogallala Aquifer at the rate that we're doing it now, there's only going to be enough water in there for another 20 years. Now imagine, and, and the article that the uh, uh, earlier researchers, the researchers did was published in uh, Harper's Magazine, and the title of their article was The Broken Heartland. Because they said if we don't have irrigation water to grow any crops in the whole center, in the whole heartland of the United States, we can only use it to put it back into grass and maybe raise some livestock. And what's that going to do to our whole food system? It's a broken, it's a broken heartland. So, uh, you know, uh, we have to begin. And then, you know, the, the, the third thing, which is not a part of the old calories, but it's also a part of anticipating the changes coming at us, is the changes in terms of climate. Now, I know we still have a lot of people that deny that climate change is real. Uh, but the evidence is overwhelming now. 
And I can tell you uh, from my own experience in North Dakota, you know, uh, August is usually a really good harvest month in North Dakota because you know, over a long period of time, it's a time when it's dry, when it's warm, you can do good harvesting. We can't get into the fields to harvest this year because it rains every other day. Just last night, I just talked to our farmer again, last night it rained two inches again. <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is about, the, about climate change is not that it's just going to get warmer, it's that we're going to have more unstable climates, more floods, more droughts, more severe weather events. And as every farmer knows, weather is a key factor in terms of being successful on our farms. So when you don't have reliable weather, and especially in the kind of this neocaloric food system that we've put together, uh, which is based entirely on maximum efficient production for short-term economic return, which has led us to put together a food system that's based on specialization. You know, if you want to be efficient, you got to specialize, because the more complexity you have, the more you have, you know, you got more stuff you got to do, it takes away from the efficiency. You want to simplify your management, because that increases your efficiency, and you go for economies of scale. So that's why in Iowa now, 92% of our cultivated land is in just two crops, corn and soybeans. So you need to have weather that's consistently favorable to corn and soybeans if farmers are going to be successful. And it's probably not the future. So let's think for a minute then. So, so what I try to put on the fable of farmers is let's not get into food fights about whether organic is better than conventional or local is better than uh, global. You know, those are all important issues, but not, let's not get just fixated on that. Let's talk, let's try to anticipate the changes that are coming at us. So let's assume that 20 years from now, crude oil will be $350 a barrel, that fertilizer costs will be five times what they are today, and they're already going up rapidly, as every farmer knows, uh, due to the, uh, the depletion of these resources. And um, let's assume that we have twice the number of severe weather events. Can you still do what you're doing? If you're a conventional farmer, organic farmer, any other kind of farmer, can you then still do what, you, what you're doing? And if not, then how do we begin to address uh, the challenges of the future? So those, I think, are some of the, some of the issues that, uh, that we have to put on the table. Now, uh, so that's, that's the bad news part. Now, there is also embedded in this also some good news because, you know, we as a human species tend not to uh, rise to important challenges and take uh, strong uh, action to deal with those until we begin to feel the pain, right? Now the really tricky part here is, and all of any of these issues that I mentioned where we begin to feel the pain, we can still do something about. The, the tricky part is going to be climate change because there's a certain point at which if we don't begin to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, et cetera, then we start to fundamentally change the way the planet functions, which may not be uh, a survivable uh, planet for the human species. And that's basically what the climatologists are telling us now. The most recent report from the International Panel of Climate Change, uh, in which incidentally, almost a third of their report was focused on how climate change is already affecting our food system. But they pointed out that we only now have about 15 years to begin to put a cap on carbon and begin to, to uh, sequester carbon out of the atmosphere if we want to continue to have a planet that's going to be favorable to the human species. 15 years, not a long period of time. So, so, so if we begin to experience the beginnings of some of this pain and that drives us then to start take, making the kinds of changes that we need to make, that's a positive, that's a positive thing. Uh, Thomas Berry, who is one of my other heroes, he a, was a theologian actually, and he referred to moments of crisis as moments of grace because he said we almost never take actions appropriately to do the right thing until, until we feel the pain and the moments of crisis would do that, so we have to regard them as moments of grace. That's what brings about the changes. So, um, so, so let's, let's talk about some of, the, uh, some, of the, some of the positive things. And some people refer to these as models that are out there. And some of this also gets back to what I'm sure Ken talked about yesterday, is some of the new models that are already emerging that at least begin to move us in the right direction. Uh, but if you talk about them as models, then we start, sort of start to think, well, all I got to do is the same thing that so-and-so is doing. You know? So if I, you know, I went to visit uh, Tom Wiley's farm in uh, California a few weeks ago, uh, 
and he's doing some amazing things, but he's, you know, he's raising fruits and vegetables on a fairly large scale. Um, and if I looked at what he did and said, oh, all I got to do is copy that and do it in North Dakota, you know, it'd be a total failure because North Dakota can't do what they're doing in California. It's a different ecology. So I prefer to use, the, to, instead of the term models, to use the term beacons to shed some light on what are things do, what are, what are the things out there that are working that look like they're beginning to move us in the right direction that we can take from that the information and then apply that, you know, to our own space, to our own ecologies. Uh, so let's think, let's talk about this in terms of some of the beacons out, out there. So um, one of the first beacons that uh, I think we, sh and probably the most fundamental ones that we need to pay attention to, is that we know that where farmers have worked to restore the biological health of their soil, they have begun to move in a direction that begins to address many of these challenges that I just talked about. Because when you have biologically healthy soil, the soil restores much more energy in the soil, stores much more fertility in the soil, so you don't need all of those inputs that we're not going to have available to us anymore. Um, it also uh, begins to absorb much more moisture. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the really encouraging things, there's another, another kind of beacon here that for me is, that, that what's happening right now in many parts of the United States and the Natural Resources Conservation Service has become a big advocate of this now and that's planting of cover crops. And what we've discovered now based on what's already been done and farmers are already doing is that even when you have a typical specialized corn soybean farm like we have in many parts of the, of the Corn Belt, when farmers incorporate a cover crop into that corn soybean rotation, and usually the way that's done, you know, you, you uh, in fact, there's some, uh, again, very innovative kinds of things. We use, we're now using, converting some of these, you know, these tall, whatever we call them, uh, you know, uh, herbicide applicators that you can apply fungicides in the cornfield when the, when the corn is already, you know, full growth without harming the corn. They're now adapting those to plant cover crops while the corn is still, you know, in full growth. So that by the time they harvest the corn, the cover crops are already about six to eight inches tall. Whereas if you wait until the corn is harvested, then of course you're going to have less time for that cover crop to do its good stuff. But anyway, we're farmers that have been planting cover crops now for six to seven years consistently. They have been able to, re to reduce their fertilizer and pesticide input by 70%, still maintain their yields. And the quality of their soil, the biological health of their soil gets restored to a point where instead of soil, which is true of much of the soils in the world now, only absorbing a half inch of rainfall an hour, the soil now absorbs eight inches of rainfall an hour. Now think about that for a minute if you have these unstable climates. During the flooding times, the soil is going to absorb much more of that moisture and it's not going to run off and cause damage in other parts of the community. And when you have drought periods, you're going to have all those moisture stored up in the soil uh, to, uh, to, 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 to feed the crops during drought periods. And we're already seeing that start to play out. And right now, uh, I can tell you that there are already some of the large monoculture farmers in Iowa that are now doing cover crops on a regular basis. Again, it's that you know, you're feeling that pain. You start to see the immediate short-term return. I mean, if you're only buying 30% uh, uh, 30, 30 of the amount of fertilizer and pesticides that you were before, you're saving a lot of money. And so those are, those are good incentives. So there's some of these things, these, some of these kinds of things that, uh, that are happening. But in any case, uh, restoring the biological health of soil um, is, uh, is, is probably the most important thing that we need to do now in anticipating the uh, future. Whatever, whatever, whatever you're growing, whether it's grain or uh, livestock or uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, the soil is the foundation. A second foundation is the biodiversity and genetic diversity. And Gary Paul Nabin uh, published a book a few years ago called Where Our Food Comes From. And he made a very important analysis about, you know, where we've, where we've moved now as we've moved into this neocaloric era. You know, farmers used to save their seeds and, and very often uh, paid a great deal of attention to the kinds of breeds of animals that they had that were well adapted to their local, local ecologies. And so we had this diversity of seeds, you know, all over the planet.
And then as we started to get into the neocaloric period where we wanted to specialize and simplify things, et cetera, we started to, you know, plant, you know, you have one variety of uh, grain that you get sold th throughout the world. And then you lose that diversity. And instead of raising three or four or five crops in rotation, we want to raise just one or two again in the interest of specialization. So we have lost that biological diversity. And you also want to have uh, a genetic system that uh, provides for maximum yields uh, with, with all of the inputs that you need in order to make that happen. And then you reduce the genetic diversity. So we now need to begin to restore as much as possible our biological diversity and genetic diversity. And again, Gary Paul Navin makes a very convincing case for why we need to do this around the world and gives some very concrete examples. You know, if you're growing, uh, 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 producing food in uh, uh, places like the desert southwest uh, as compared to North Dakota or compared to the northeast, you know, you need different kinds of uh, biological diversity and different kinds of genetic diversity in order to be successful. So that's the second thing that we, that's the second kind of beacon that we need to pay attention to. Uh, a third thing I think is for us, and, and we begin to move now into some of uh, more cultural kinds of issues, um, and that is uh, we need to begin to think about uh, how, how we actually eat. You know, Wendell Berry reminded us a long time ago that the way we eat to a large extent determines the kind of world we live in. And I think all of us who pay attention to that know that that's true. Um, but there's, uh, there, there's some interesting kinds of uh, things happening now. Uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Dan Barber, who's a chef uh, actually at the, uh, at the uh, Stone Barns Center that uh, uh, John talked about earlier, where I have the, the privilege of getting to know Dan. And Dan, as a chef, uh, has his passion, of course, is having the best tasting food in the world. And he began to realize early in his career that the way you get the best tasting food is to find farmers who are managing their soil in terms of the biological health of the soil. Because if you get food from this biologically healthy soil, then a chef, all he needs to do is prepare the food in a way that allows the natural flavors to express themselves. And it's the best tasting food in the world. But Dan also, every time he finds a farmer that produces this kind of quality of food, he, wa he wants to go visit the farmer. You know, he gets on a plane and goes to Spain where a farmer's doing something interesting around seafood. Um, and, um, and, then, and then to see how the farmer's doing this. And in the process, he began to learn that what he was doing as a chef was simply cherry picking from the farmer those things that he was producing that were of this exceptional quality. And he wasn't paying attention to everything that the farmer had to do to get to that kind of quality, to get that soil quality. And so he started to visit farmers to, to begin to better understand what they had to do and how he then as a chef could support that. And so he's written a new book now called The Third Plate. And uh, what he discovered that, you know, what he means by the third, the first, the first plate is, you know, when we want our food fast, convenient, and cheap, right? The second plate is uh, we want, uh, you know, more organic food, more grass-fed meats, et cetera. And all of that uh, is, is fine, but it still doesn't get us where we need to do because, it's, because we're still kind of cherry-picking from the farmer. And, and Dan, Really came, really came home for him when he started to work with Klaus Martens, who's a farmer who grows grain in, in upstate New York. And Klaus Martin was producing a variety of emmer wheat that was just out of this world. And so Dan went to Klaus's farm to find out how he was doing that. And he found out that Klaus had to grow some cover crops from which he was not getting any income. He had to grow some other crops in the crop rotation like barley and, and millet which he had to sell as animal feed because there was no market as a food product for that. And he wasn't getting, getting a lot of income from that. And so Dan began to realize that he could not just continue to cherry pick the emmer wheat from him. He needed to find a way to eat from the whole farm, as he put it. And then he began to talk to Klaus and uh, they began to work together. And he, Dan began to realize that he could actually harvest some of the leaves from the cover crops that he could use for really good salads in the restaurant and not harm the benefits that the cover crop was still doing in terms of restoring the biological health of soil. So now Klaus is getting some income 
from the cover crop as well as the ecological benefits of restoring the health of the soil. And then Dan began to discover that he could put some things on the menu and prepare some foods that were made from the barley and from the millet, which he could then pay Klaus the kind of uh, return that he gets for selling food crops instead of animal feed. And that begins to now. And so now it's this whole farm system and eating from the whole farm. And that I think is a, is a fascinating concept. And I don't think it's just chefs that can begin to think about it in this way. But this gets us down to another, another kind of beacon that I would like to share with all of you. And that is, there was an article published in uh, uh, Harvard Business Review uh, back in uh, January, February of 2011 by Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. Now, Michael Porter and Mark Kramer are two of our leading economists in the country and maybe in the world. So these are not, you know, uh, weird agrarian uh, farmers like me or in, in environmentalists. These are some of our key economists. And they wrote this article to the business community. And the title of the article is Creating Shared Value. And they point out that companies who are going to continue to do business by the old playbook, as they called it, which is to marginalize your labor and raw materials as much as possible so you can maximize your profit in your company, that that's not going to work in the future because, because we're, now mar we're now so marginalizing our labor and our raw materials that they're not going to be, that's not, that resource is not going to be there for you if we don't you know, have, have companies operating on the basis of shared value. And then they also said that if we continue to externalize our environmental costs and our social costs in order to maximize the profit in our company, that's not going to work in the future because our social capital and our, uh, and our natural capital is now becoming so compromised that we're not going to be able to have successful businesses within those kinds of communities and in, 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 in that kind of ecological environment. So it's time now, they said, that companies began to design businesses that were operated on the basis of creating shared value. And that's essentially what Dan Barber has, is doing on a very small scale with the farmers from whom he's buying in order to have the best kind of food in his restaurant. How can we, take, how can we begin to develop a culture in which we create this kind of shared value? And you know, I could go on with a lot of this, but let me, let me just uh, kind of close with, uh, because uh, these cultural shifts, as we all know, are very difficult because we're operating today out of a culture, again, that has developed with this, with this uh, industrial economy that I mentioned earlier, uh, in which it's all about me and mine and, and, and about now. Uh, so we want to get things done now. We want, you know, if we start a business, we want it to be successful in the first year or two. Uh, if we do agriculture, we want to get the highest yield possible every year on a short-term basis without any attention hardly at all about the law, what we're doing to the long-term resources, the long-term capabilities, and, and, and in terms of, of, of doing things in terms that are of benefit to the entire community. And there are a lot of examples of this now. Uh, and, one of the, and here again, part of the good news is that while we've developed this culture about mine and now, uh, the next generation is coming along. And again, I don't want to be romantic about this because I'm not saying it's 100%. But there are a growing number of the next generation coming along who really get this because they realize that the mine and now kind of culture has not provided the kind of quality of life they want because, it, they, because they don't have those, those, this, this kind of uh, you know, connection with the rest of the community where the community is in it together. And again, there are resources here you can look at. Uh, Marjorie Kelly uh, published a book a few years ago called Owning Our Future. And she says that we now operate out of two different kinds of economies. One's the extractive economy, and that's the mine and now kind of economy. And the other is what she calls the generative economy. And that's where communities work together for what she calls the common flourishing of life. And this new generation coming along now, that's what they're looking for, that common flourishing of life within communities. And that's very inspiring. And I, I meet some of these young people all across the country. And so we need to, I think, listen to them, figure out how we support them, et cetera. But, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, get close to closing with this. Uh, a new book which just came out by Paul Roberts. Those of you who've read some of his books before know he's a, he's a great author, uh, lives out on the West Coast. His new book is The Impulse Society. And he does an amazing job in this 
of describing to us how this world that we've created for ourselves with this culture of mine and now is really just becoming dysfunctional now. And there is, again, the good news here is that there's beginning to be an awareness of this and that we can't continue into the long-term future this way. And, and this has to be a bottom-up, this has to be a bottom-up change. Cultures don't change from the top down. They change from the bottom up. They change by what we do in our communities. And one of the reasons for gatherings like this are so important because you become part of uh, you know, the, this, this bottom up, this cultural change from the bottom. And, um, and, and uh, Paul Roberts does a great uh, job pointing out where this is already beginning to happen around the country and we can be a part of that. Now, so let me close with, the, with one final uh, comment here, and that is that I think one of the other things that we have not, one of the other resources that we have not used uh, sufficiently in terms of bringing about these cultural changes and cultural shifts is the arts. Because, you know, if we continue to operate out of our perception that the current life that we have is the best that it's ever been, we're going to continue to hang on to that, right? Uh, all of the studies, however, have indicated that this is not as good a life as it's ever been. Our rates of depression are higher, our rates of anxiety are higher, our rates of suicide are higher than they were back in the 1950s before we started on this consumptive society. We, in fact, we called this the gospel of consumption uh, back in the 1930s as we started to move in this direction. And so uh, the arts can help us to imagine a better life than the one that we're currently living that can begin to change that culture in which we will then be much more willing to embrace these kinds of changes uh, that we have to make if we want to have that future food system uh, that's going to be sustainable for us uh, on this timeline that's up on the screen. Uh, and there are some great examples of, uh, of the arts and uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to Borrow one more, one more minute here. One incidentally uh, on, around soil is if none of you have ever seen uh, Deborah Kunz Garcia's The Symphony of Soil, uh, I would urge, urge you really to bring it into your community because nobody can see the symphony of soil and still think that soil is just dirt. Because soil is this living community that took millions of years to evolve and we now have this incredible treasure uh, that we need to we need to preserve and restore and and make part of our future, and uh, you know her documentary is an hour and a half long, and I told her when she was making it, I said you got to shorten this because nobody wants to sit through a hour an hour and a half documentary, and I've now sat through uh, six of presentations of the Symphony of Soil, and I expect you know always that people are going to start leaving after an hour because it almost stay that long. Nobody ever leaves. And most everybody at the end gets teared up about it. So it's a very powerful use of the arts to help us understand why the soil is so important. And then let me add uh, one other thing. Uh, uh, Kathleen Dean Moore, who's a friend of mine, who's the head of the philosophy department at, uh, at uh, Oregon State University. And uh, she told me when she became a philosopher that uh, she began to realize that philosophers often use such a dense language they didn't even understand each other, let alone the general public. And she didn't want to be a part of that. So she decided to take these philosophical ideas and turn them into stories so that people could connect with them and be, be impacted by them. And in her book, uh, The Pine Island Paradox, uh, she has a chapter where she talks about some of the philosophical concepts that can help to address some of the issues in terms of um, in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the kinds of uh, responsibilities and changes we need to make. And then in the middle of that chapter, she imagines her granddaughter writing her a letter from 100 years in the future. And what would she say? And this is her artistic contribution to that conversation. And this is what she imagines that her granddaughter would write to her. How could you not have known? What more evidence did you need that your lives, your comfortable lives, would do so much damage to ours. Did you think that you could wage war against nations without waging war against people and against the earth? Didn't you wonder what we would drink once you had poisoned the aquifers? Didn't you wonder what we would breathe once you had poisoned the air? Did you stop to ask how we would be safe in a world poisoned by war? Did you think it all belonged to you, this beautiful earth? You who loved your children? Did you think that we could live without clean air and healthy cities? 
You who love the earth, did you think that we could live without birdsong and swaying trees? And if you knew, how could you not care? What could matter to you more than your children and their babies? How could a parent destroy what is life-giving and astonishing to her child's world? And if you knew and if you cared, how could you not act? What excuses did you make? And now, what would you have us do? I think it's these kinds of stories, these kinds of artistic creations that can begin to motivate us as a community uh, to move uh, beyond the impulse society where everything is about mine and now and we begin to think about it in terms of the world that our grandchildren will inherit and why it's important for us in our own communities uh, to become engaged in this now. So I'll leave you with that and uh, hopefully we can have some conversations further about any questions you have about this this afternoon.